Morning, everyone. My name is Suzanne Walker, and I am the supervisor from the Indiana State Library's Professional Development Office. Thank you all so much for joining us for today's webinar. We are so pleased to have Leah here from Indiana Humanities, as well as Christy here from the Indiana State Library's Young Reader Center, to talk to us today about Quantum Leap and the Indiana Humanities' new exciting theme for their two years of programming. So excited. I'd like to start off the webinar with a few announcements. This webinar is provided as part of the Library's Trends and Hot Topics series. And to register for other webinars available for this series or other trainings available from the Professional Development Office, please see the Indiana State Library's events calendar, which can be found on our website at library.in.gov under Services for Libraries. For a full list of our current in-person training menu, please see our Continuing Education website. The Indiana State Library has many ways that we try to stay connected to library staff across the state. For weekly updates on upcoming trainings and to learn more about what's happening in libraries across the state, please subscribe to our weekly e-newsletter, The Wednesday Word. I know many of you already do that. We also offer a blog which provides information about the Indiana State Library's collection as well as interview spotlights on library staff from across the state and information about upcoming events at the State Library. Okay, now I'm going to talk to you about sound. If you are having sound issues during the webinar, you need to see the sound issues pod that is directly below your chat box. If there is a global sound issue, we will announce it in the chat box. If you are unable to resolve the sound issue by looking at the audio setup wizard, we are recording this meeting. Ta-da! And you can watch it offline after the meeting has ended. So again, if there's a global sound issue, please refer to the audio setup wizard below the chat box. At this time, we are not experiencing any global sound issues. So again, today's webinar will be archived and available to access and share on the Indiana State Library's archive trainings page. I also want to let you know that your LEU is going to be available for download immediately following the webinar. So I will walk you through that process. I know that's probably new for many of you. This is a new um, thing that we're doing so that you can get your LEU immediately. So without further ado, we are going to turn the presentation over to Leah. Leah, how do you pronounce your last name? Namias. Namias. Okay. We will get you started here in a second. Hi everybody, this is Leah Namias from Indiana Humanities. And this is Christy Fransman from the Indiana State Library. And we are super excited to talk to you guys today about um, STEM opportunities for libraries. So you can see our faces there in front of you. Um, that's from when I went to Italy and got to drive a really cool old car um, that I could barely fit inside. <laughs> and what about your picture? This is of course with me with Garfield outside the Indiana Young Reader Center here at the State Library. So I just want to start with a brief overview of what we're trying to accomplish with today's presentation. So first we want to introduce Indiana Humanities' new Quantum Leap initiative. Um, then we want to share Quantum Leap programs, grants, and resources from Indiana Humanities. So these are things that we are putting out into the world and hoping that you'll take advantage of. Um, and then Christy's going to talk about um, ways for libraries to take part, or we'll talk about ways for libraries to take part in Quantum Leap. And Christy will share some other strategies for libraries to incorporate STEM programming. Um, and then I think when I think about what my goals are, I hope that you leave us with all kinds of ideas. I hope your imaginations are firing and you've got lots of ideas and that I get emails and calls from you in the weeks ahead about ways to partner with Indiana Humanities over the next two years. So let me start by just introducing, ta-da, the logo for Quantum Leap. Um, Quantum Leap is Indiana Humanities' new two-year initiative that is exploring the intersection of STEM, so STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, and medicine, and the humanities. Um, and we'll talk lots about what the humanities are, but usually the humanities are literature, philosophy, history, cultural studies, um, art history, stuff like that. So we just launched Quantum Leap in March, and we'll be running this theme for the next two years through the end of 2018. Um, throughout the initiative, we will be offering new programs, special grants, resources, and doing some convening to get people together to talk about these issues. Um, 
So there will be lots of opportunities for Hoosiers to think, read, and talk about the intersection of STEM and humanities. We chose this theme in part because over the last two years as we were doing bicentennial themed work, we were talking a lot about the idea of the next Indiana. And Hoosiers told us that they feel like science and technology are going to play a really big role in the future of Indiana. So not just, you know, especially as it relates to our economy, I also think that we feel like there's a very proud history of Hoosier ingenuity um, and science and invention in, in Indiana that we wanted to highlight. And then finally, um, people want to talk about the ways that STEM is changing our lives. Um, so that's another opportunity for us to do that. So internally at Indiana Humanities, we've been talking about three kind of animating ideas, the big ideas um, that are really guiding how we choose what programs to do and what ideas to explore with Hoosiers. So I'm just going to read these to you and maybe see if these start to fire your imagination a little bit. We want to explore, explore the spirit of possibility and problem solving that occurs when we bridge the humanities with science, technology, engineering, math, and medicine. We've talked a lot about, about how much we love the way that scientists are problem solvers. They're doers. And if we could take that attitude and apply it to not just scientific problems, but all kinds of um, issues and challenges, we just love that spirit of problem solving and possibility. Um, scientists never say, oh, I don't know how to do that. They're like, I'm going to figure out how to do that. And we really like that. Um, we want to explore how Hoosiers have, do, and could innovate in the STEM fields to create a better, and by better we mean healthier, happier, possibly more prosperous, and more fair society. So that's our way for getting into, um, you know, the history of science and technology and invention in Indiana. Um, that kind of whole question of our past as well as an opportunity to look and see what's happening today around Indiana. And then the last thing is we want to create space for Hoosiers to wrestle with the changes that are being wrought by STEM innovation, both exciting and scary. So for instance, it's very exciting that I can talk to you remotely from Indianapolis <laughs> all over the, the state, <laughs> but sometimes it's kind of scary that these things are happening so fast and we don't understand all these technology we're carrying around with us in our pocket, for instance. Um, so. Just to get started on some of the resources that we've created and programs coming your way, um, on the screen right now is hopefully something you may have seen because you got one in the mail. So as part of our launch for Quantum Leap, we mailed a poster of Hoosier Ingenuity to every school and library in the state. Um, so this poster features some of our favorite inventions um, from Indiana's history, um, and we hope that you'll hang it in a place that inspires the next generation of tinkerers and inventors and creators. Um, if we have lots more of these <laughs> available, and they are free, so you can go on our website, and we'll make sure you know where to look for that later. Um, you can go on our website, and there's a really easy form. You can request up to 10 additional posters, and we'll mail those out to you within the week. So this is a great opportunity for schools and libraries to kind of uh, be thinking about Quantum Leap, thinking about who's your ingenuity and inspiring future um, innovators and inventors. Many of you are probably already familiar with Indiana Humanities Novel Conversations program, but I'll give it a plug anyway. Novel Conversations is our free statewide lending library of book sets. So it's a great opportunity for book clubs as well as um, classroom educators, um, anybody who needs to borrow not just one copy of a book, but up to 15 or 20 copies of a book. Um, so Novel Conversations uh, is free. We use Info Express. It's one of our favorite partnerships with the State Library. We decided to curate a Quantum Leap collection um, for Novel Conversations. So we added a few books that we think are really good at exploring these questions about the intersection of STEM and humanities. Some of them are classics. We're going to talk a lot more about Frankenstein, so I'll wait on that one. But a lot of you may know about The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, which Oprah is making into a movie that will premiere on HBO later this month. Woo! Great time to read that book. Um, as well as um, books like Hidden Figures, another one that has a great movie tie-in, um, as more classics like Brave New World, and then some other really great books. We kind of did a poll of people, um, books that they really love that help us ask big questions about science and its role in our lives. So we hope that if you're looking for an easy way to connect to Quantum Leap, you might just um, hop on the Novel Conversations website, borrow a set of books, and then you can read along with us as we're exploring these issues over the next two years. 
now I get to talk about something that I'm very excited to talk about. Yay! Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so, for a while, um, we've really loved working with the Indiana State Library, and we've been talking about, could we do a statewide read of a book? And could we do it tied to our next thematic initiative? So a couple of years ago, I was pondering, I kind of knew our next theme would be about science and technology. And then I realized that Frankenstein is like the best book that's ever been written about questions of science and technology and how it shapes our lives and what can go wrong if you're not careful when you're inventing new things or playing around with life. Um, so I kind of pitched it to Suzanne and she was like, sure, let's do it. Then I realized that the book's 200th anniversary was going to be during um, the second year of our thematic initiative. So this book was written 200 years ago, in, in 2018 will be its 200th birthday. It was written by a teenage girl. A lot of people don't know that. Mary Shelley was 17 when she started writing this book. She was 19 when it was published. The story of the book's creation, as well as the ideas that it entails, are really, really important questions for us to be thinking about as we explore the role of science in our lives and um, the consequences of new technology. So we're really excited to announce that this is going to be our one state, one story read for 2018. Um, you know, for us, when it comes to asking the hard questions at the heart of scientific in um, innovation, perhaps no book has ever topped Frankenstein. Um, so some of the themes are the role of science in society, the history of science, questions around unintended consequences. There are a few themes that very much relate to science and technology today, so questions around biomedical engineering, artificial intelligence, and then there are some other questions that really help us think about gender and the role of people who are different in our society. Those are all questions that are raised by this book, among many others. So we think it's a great selection um, for us to use as part of our Quantum Leap One State, One Story. I'm going to highlight a few things that will be coming to life. You know, we like to make Frankenstein puns now, <laughs> so we say things like, it's alive. Um, so things coming to life over the next two years. The first thing, and this is, you know, designed for libraries with librarians in mind, um, we will be sponsoring community reads of this book. So this will entail a $1,000 mini grant, and we don't even like to use the word grant because you don't have to match it. It's just $1,000. It's almost like a stipend. Plus books. You'll be able to request up to 75 books and you can use those funds and books to organize three or more community programs in 2018. So the idea is that you'll have at least one book discussion, um, and, and you can do that a book discussion for teens, a book discussion for adults, an intergenerational book discussion, and then you, can, you have to organize at least two more, but really as many as you like, additional programs. And we'll talk about what some of those resources for you will be. We will also send you bookmarks and posters and other goodies that is going to be a surprise. Um, to help you spread the word, promote your programs, and get people excited about Frankenstein. We are developing, thanks to Christy and all of her great ideas, a program guide that will have short essays, suggested discussion questions, program ideas, additional reading and viewing lists, everything that you really need to imagine and implement a great series of programs in your community. Um, applications for this will open in September. With one, I want to put an asterisk next to that. We know that some teachers may want to start teaching with the book next fall because they'll want to do programs in the 2017-2018 um, time frame. So all that teachers need to do, we will have an early decision process for teachers basically. They just need to email me um, and I will send them the application early and we can um, let them know by August so that they can start the school year off right. So those are some opportunities for librarians to come up with creative programs in their community. So I, this is Suzanne. I just have one quick question, which maybe some people on the webinar are wondering too. The three uh, programs we have to do, so one needs to be a book discussion. Can you talk just, and maybe you're planning on doing this, but can you talk a little bit more about what the other two programs could be? Yes. Do we have to do three book discussions? No. Okay. Okay. So three Frankenstein related programs. One of them has to be a book discussion because I'm just like a nerd and I think everyone <laughs> should talk about books. But you could do a film screening and discussion. You could do a read-alike, and Christy's going to talk about that with young readers um, who maybe aren't ready to read a 200-year-old book yet. Um, you could do uh, hands-on makerspace activities. Uh, Christy's going to talk some more about ideas for that. Um, you could do, uh, you could have speakers, and actually that brings up my next point. Um, we are going to be putting together a speakers bureau 
of experts and scholars um, who are prepared to give talks on all different aspects of Frankenstein. So that will be a resource that you can turn to if you want to book a speaker to come and give a talk um, on something related to Frankenstein. Um, we also will invite you to come up with creative ideas of your own. The other things that you might do, just brainstorming here, is you know, uh, Frankenstein is considered one of the first, if not the first, science fiction book and horror book. So you could do things where you're reading other works of science fiction or other works of horror. You could do a creative writing workshop around horror or science fiction. Um, I would encourage you to do things with teenagers because this is a great book that was written by a teenager and I find that particularly inspiring. Um, so those are a few ideas of, of programs you could do with that $1,000 um, and with those books. Um, I now want to transition, and I'm happy to answer more questions about this, some of the other things that we're doing as part of Frankenstein. We are doing a kickoff, we're now calling it a Frankenfest. Oh, nice. um, yeah, do you like that? I okay, love good. It. Okay. Love it. Um, so I've been told that a readathon doesn't sound very exciting, but you're a bunch of librarians, so I do suspect <laughs> this is the one group who finds that word very enticing. So we're going to be on um, next fall, uh, Saturday, September 30th, at the Indiana Medical History Museum here in Indianapolis, which is a really cool place where there are like brains in jars. So it's the perfect place to read Frankenstein. We're going to be doing a whole Frankenstein themed festival, and we're going to invite readers of all ages to come and join us. There'll be all kinds of different things happening, including a just straight readathon of the book. We'll have special thematically appropriate food and drinks and activities, and we'll have mini talks, and you'll you'll just walk away super excited about Frankenstein. So we're partnering with the State Library to do that next fall. We are also planning to do, for the first time that we've ever tried it, a special weekend retreat. And this will basically be like going to a mini college or university course for adults. It's a chance for people to come together for a weekend and geek out about all things <laughs> Frankenstein. So you'll read the book ahead of time, and then you'll come. We're going to host this at DePaul University. We're still nailing down the final date, but probably February or March of 2018. Um, and there will be a themed dinner, and there will be performances, and there will be scholar talks and discussions. There will be all things Frankenstein. And you will find your tribe at this event if you are a Frankenstein geek like I am. We are also planning, and this is uh, still a ways off, in the fall of 2018, we will be hosting the first ever Indiana Sci-Fi and Horror Writers Festival for teens. So yay, in honor of Mary Shelley being a teenager and the fact that this book has inspired generations of horror and sci-fi writers. We will be doing a festival. We'll be featuring Hoosier authors who write science fiction and horror. We will have writing workshops and maker spaces and television and film screenings. One of our ideas is to look at the, the story, uh, the show Stranger Things, which mm -hmm. is set in Indiana, and is actually a really good illustration a lot of the conventions of horror and sci-fi. So to view that and talk about it. So more information will be coming about that, um, but we're planning to do that in the fall of 2018. And then we're also going to be just having all kinds of other things going on. We've actually partnered with 11 colleges and universities around the state who are going to be doing their own Frankenstein programming. So that includes everything from special exhibits. So down at um, Lilly Library at IU and up at Notre Dame, they have first editions of Frankenstein. So they'll be building exhibits around that. There will be performances. We discovered that there is a professor at Ball State who wrote an original musical based on Frankenstein. Me. I know. So we're going to revive that. Um, we're going to, there'll be film festivals, um, University of Indianapolis and IU East are both going to develop um, online courses that people can take about Frankenstein. So there's going to be all kinds of other things happening as part of this statewide read of Frankenstein. Um, our imaginations have been going wild and so far my boss has not said no to any of it. So that's <laughs> a good thing. It's always good. <laughs> So I'm going to turn it over to Christy now to talk a little bit about some other ways that you can program with Frankenstein in your library um, and some other STEM opportunities. So first up, uh, take advantage of those the book kits. Um, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. There's four kits available through Indiana Humanities Novel Conversations. So definitely take advantage of those. If you're thinking about um, doing a graphic novel club, um, I went through several of the Frankenstein graphic novels and chose Frankenstein the graphic novel adapted by Bridget Viney. And it's, I just thought it was awesome. It's great for YA clubs. Um, the kits include 15 copies of the graphic novel version. And to reserve a kit, you contact the professional development office here at the Indiana State Library via email at pdo at library.in.gov. So it's a lot like maybe you've had teen book clubs or book kits before. 
and this is you would go the same route for these since they more have a, a teen or YA focus. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So now the fun stuff. Let's talk about how libraries can take the quantum leap and participate in this fun interactive statewide program. Um, it can be as easy as creating book displays. What librarian doesn't like to create a fun book display for patrons to see when they walk in? There are Frankenstein read-alikes for all ages. Um, if you haven't seen the Baby Lit series, I'm obsessed with it. Have you seen it? I give everybody I know who has a baby. I buy I them these books. Okay. I'm going to put them on my Sidebar. Register. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they have everything. So they even have a Frankenstein. So even from the littlest ones, you can find Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein, or his monster. Of course, sometimes they're used interchangeably <laughs> um, in books. So whether it's the baby books, uh, the baby lit books, there's also picture books, there's teen books that have used the theme, and even adult books. So putting those out um, for a display to, to promote the One State, One Story program. You could also create a display with STEM-related books to go along with the entire Quantum Leap theme. Books about maker spaces, space, math, all of those things would have a great display, would make a great display to get kids and, and adults excited about the program. There are some great STEM books for kids. Uh, in particular, I just picked out a couple. Um, Papa's Mechanical Fish by Candace Fleming is really cute, and The Most Magnificent Thing by Ashley Spires. So just kind of give you a couple to look at. I think the Hoosier Ingenuity poster would make a great jumping off point for a display. And I have to say, it doesn't do it justice in the slide, so I hope you received <laughs> the poster, because in real life it's bright yellow, very vibrant, and, and lots of information on there to kind of take pride in Hoosier ingenuity, <laughs> Hoosier invention. So using that poster and kind of jump off from there to talk about other Hoosier inventions and inventors or even, you know, any inventors or inventions. But there are some books out. Um, the one pictured is actually, I believe that's a graphic novel for Madam C.J. Walker. That's so cool. I, I didn't know. know about that Yeah, book. yeah. There's, there's several out there. So, um, and also, of course, uh, it's a great time in publishing for STEM <laughs> for kids right now. It's very trendy. So things like on Maker Labs and Maker Spaces and things like that make a great display. And of course, create a book list to go along with your display, um, you know, because they'll be grabbing them up like hotcakes, right? So you can have a book list, some other read-alikes, um, make little bookmarks and put those out with it. So we're kind of going to go through programming for all ages, since most libraries include programming for all ages. So first off, about the book clubs, we already talked about that a little bit. But again, take advantage of the book kits or sets from Indiana Humanities and create a book club for Frankenstein. Um, maybe you haven't read it since high school, or maybe that was just not in your curriculum. Like me, I hadn't read it before. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So I read it recently, and it is awesome, full of opportunities for discussion. So many things, so many different ways you can take it, so many questions to get the discussion going. So it really is a great book for a book club. Also, don't forget about the other titles. I think uh, Leah already kind of went over this, but the other titles in the novel, novel conversations book kits, especially Hidden Figures and The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, in particular just because the movie tie-ins um, will really help, help drum up the excitement. Those are familiar titles to a lot of people, and then you can kind of jump off from there and, and then introduce them to new titles that maybe they haven't heard of. Um, the speakers, invite the speakers from even your local universities, whether it's from the Speakers Bureau for, from Indiana Humanities, or kind of taking a look around your community and inviting them from local universities or organizations um, to give talks on different STEM topics. I mean, it's really cool. You don't have to be an expert on these topics, but you can host somebody who is. <laughs> so it makes a great program. Uh, Leah talked about some of the kickoff events that they're having, Frankenfest. I love that. I love that. Um, I really love that title. But you could hold your own kickoff event at your library for your community, um, you know, for whatever that looks like. If readathon you don't think is going to be their thing, what other activities um, you, can you provide for the whole family just to kind of kick off the initiative, kick off the one state, one story? Um, you could also do writing workshops for adults. Um, you know, even if you don't have an active writing group already at your library, this might be an opportunity to kind of dip your toes in and try one. Um, there are a lot of 
um, sci-fi writers here in Indiana, local um, sci-fi writers. That you what is invite. it about Indiana that makes people think of creepy stories? That I don't know. <laughs> okay, that's a good question for us to explore over the next Maybe year. the weather. Yeah. <laughs> Today's certainly a good day. <laughs> But we have a lot of a lot of different authors um, around the state, and in particular sci-fi. So, I think it would be great to invite them in, or maybe you have a local, you know, high school English teacher or professor that would come in and do a writing workshop about sci-fi in particular. Teen programs, <laughs> kind of my uh, my old forte here, but uh, book clubs work for teens as well. Um, you can do it in different versions depending on, you know, your group of teens. You know, every every library is different, Leah, it seems like. And so it seems it's not really a one-size-fits-all as far as teen programming. Sometimes you know your kids and your community and what's going to work. So I've included several options here. First off, you could do a, a book and movie club. Um, read Frankenstein, watch a movie version, and there's tons of them. You could go. Many good, <laughs> many bad. Yeah. <laughs> which is good for discussion. <laughs> and maybe that's funny too, you know. Yeah, some people, can I just share a tidbit? Yeah. The very first film adaptation of Frankenstein was a silent movie, and Thomas Edison made it. Oh, so, gosh. and it's all on YouTube, and it's about 15 minutes long. So, just even watching that original adaptation of Frankenstein, so one of the very first films ever made is an adaptation of Frankenstein, and it's created by Thomas Edison, one of our greatest inventors. And it's so, on YouTube? And it's on YouTube, so it's like a great quantum leap um, opportunity. That's right. awesome. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, in my former life as a teen librarian, I used to hold a never judge a book by its movie, or in jab -em. I love that. <laughs> N-J-A-B-B-I-M, never judge a book by its movie club. And we would meet toward you know the beginning of the month and hand out uh, hand out the books. We'd start reading aloud. Teenagers are not too old to read aloud if they wanted to, and of course we had snacks. And uh, you start reading the book together, and then give them you know two three weeks, usually whatever the checkout period, but plenty of time to to finish the book, and then get back together and watch a movie version. So we discuss the book, we watch the movie, and then we talk about the differences. And as you all know, the, the book is always better than the, <laughs> than the movie, but it's fun to, to talk about and discuss the differences and, and see what people think. Um, another thing you could do, Frankenstein would be great for like a mock debate. So if you had a book club and you had the kids reading Frankenstein, or really even the graphic novel version, um, to hold a mock debate, there are so many topics for teens to discuss. The question of ethics and scientific discovery, who is ultimately responsible for the events that transpire in the book? I mean, was it the monster's fault, or was it really Dr. Frankenstein for creating it in the first place? I mean, there's so many things. So they could each take a side and then debate that after reading the book, and I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, also, if you're not sure if, if the classic Frankenstein book is going to draw in your kids, your teens, consider taking advantage of the book kits um, with a graphic novel version adapted by Bridget Viney again. Um, I'm not a huge graphic novel fan, <laughs> I have to admit. I feel like that's not a popular opinion. Um, but I loved this one. I really liked it. I thought it included enough of the original um, content from the book, but kind of skipped over the things, the details that might drag some teens down. You know what <laughs> I mean? That make it, make it some of them a little harder for them to get through. And the graphics, of course, were super creepy and dark and, and lovely. So, <laughs> so it was a really good ad adaptation. And I think um, it's quick enough, but it's got enough meat to it that it would make a really good uh, book club choice as well. So you could also do a writing workshop with teens. Um, you could even use the exquisite corpse game. Very appropriate for Frankenstein because right? he's stitched together out of <laughs> vaguely described body parts. Exactly. Yeah. It just all works, right? So if you're not familiar, the exquisite corpse can really be done with art or writing. Um, but what you do is, is you have each teen writes different parts of a story. So you have someone write a beginning, you have someone write a middle without seeing the beginning, and then you have someone write an end without seeing the other parts. So some structure by you is going to be needed to kind of give them a format and, and how to go about it. But mostly they use their creativity. And then the end results are a lot like reading out, out loud Mad Libs. Um, when you read out loud and share them, it can be a lot of fun. And you can do it over and over with different structure, different story starters, 
or anything like that. So it might be fun, especially for maybe teens who don't feel like they're writers or they don't feel, you know, it's all for fun. It's supposed to be fun. Um, so it's kind of a neat game that you can do for writing. You could also hold a teen art contest, maybe design a new cover uh, for Frankenstein or even broaden the scope to any STEM theme um, art, you know, artwork for some more variety. You can display the artwork if you have a community room or a display case and maybe even bring in the public to get involved by letting them be the judges or other teens um, at a program and, and include the art. Um, extending the theme, so a little beyond <laughs> the theme, one of the fun, most fun things I saw was the Franken toys. It kind of reminds me of the creepy neighbor kid in Toy Story, <laughs> right? That took his <laughs> took his little sister's toys and made them into new creepy toys. But these are, and there's an example from TeenServicesUnderground.com that you dismantle, uh, dismantle, gently used or donated toys to create new Franken toys. So this one might be, you know, might have to use some creative creativity to gather the toys <laughs> for the program, but looks like Donna, you love the Franken toys. <laughs> I wonder if anybody at the end when we're talking about this, like if anybody's actually done this program, because I think it looks so much fun. Totally. Oh, yep. Yeah. Perfect. So then children's programs, you may not think that Frankenstein uh, can be used in children's programs, but actually STEM is a huge trend in library and school programming, but there's also a lot of things uh, with, with Frankenstein, even in picture books and, and crafts and things like that. So as far as STEM, first of all, I wanted to plug the Big Idea Storytime Kit. Um, that add math and science to preschool story times, and they're available through the Indiana State Library even before we knew about this wonderful initiative. So uh, don't forget about those. And then there are also several picture books that feature Frankenstein and his monster. So here at the State Library and the Young Reader Center, of course, we have a collection of solely uh, of books by Indiana authors and illustrators. But even in this collection, I found Frankie Stein Starts School <laughs> by Hoosier author Lola M. Schaefer. So that's just one example of using the character. Um, and then a quick search on Pinterest, and there are all sorts of Frankenstein crafts for preschoolers, um, elementary school age, and also treats <laughs> if you want to do some fun treats for the program. With all the great uh, STEM books being published for kids, it makes our jobs a little easier to pair them with fun science experiments and lessons for children. So another, uh, another one I pulled from our collection, Captain Kids Crew Experiments with Sinking and Floating by Mark Weekland and illustrated by Hoosier author Troy Cumming is a great example. You can easily pair this with a hands-on sink and float activity. Um, I don't know if anybody attended uh, I did, and it kind of stuck with me. Back at CYPD last year was the whole reboot theme, and I believe it was Becky Stuck at Hussey Mayfield Memorial Public mm -hmm. Library um, did Rebooting Young Minds with Preschool Engineering, and she did a whole program, or a whole breakout session on the program, series of programs that she did, where she had kids come in, they read stories, and then they did a lot of STEM experiments. And I just remember that sticking with me because I thought that was such a great idea. Who knew that you could bring these concepts down to preschoolers and they get it. So, um, And so I kind of used that when I did the Firefly webinar last week because you can take books that aren't Frankenstein or aren't um, obvious STEM books, like some of our Firefly nominees actually, like Best in Snow, um, you could do solid versus liquid and talk about that and do experiments with melting ice and water and get them get them in there. Um, don't wake up the tiger. Not really a STEM. Yeah, it doesn't really have a STEM though, theme. <laughs> but it, right, don't wake up the tiger. But you could talk about have a helium filled balloon and use different objects to wait on the end of it and see which ones float and which ones kind of dip down. And if you haven't read Don't Wake the Tiger, you should. Different animals tried to float over tiger <laughs> to not wake up the tiger. Um, race car count is a good one to use with ramps and inclines. And what kid doesn't like racing cars, right? So there's different things, even 
even books that you wouldn't think of that you could definitely relate and have some STEM activities. So some more children's programs. Again, back to that Hoosier Ingenuity poster, it provides the perfect jumping off point to begin talking to kids about inventions and inventors, um, talk with children about the cool things invented in Indiana, but also set them free to invent new things um, using a variety of supplies. I found, if you'll see in the picture from uh, the educators, what is it, educatorsspinonit.com, they created uh, an inventor supply lab with mostly a lot of recycled kind of items and duct tape, of course. You always, need, <laughs> you always need duct tape. But a lot of recycled items and just sort of let the kids go and invent new things. And that would be a fun program. Um, you could read books about different inventors or inventions and then create your craft or activity related to those specific books. Um, and also extending the theme can get really fun. There's probably a lot of you who are already doing STEM programming. Um, but I found some of these, I really like this circuits, make paper circuit monsters that light up and come to life. So that one looks like a robot, but how cool you can make a Frankenstein That's awesome. circuit and, and light well, them up. Well, and that would be super appropriate because just more about Frankenstein yeah. <laughs> because I'm really geeky about it. Um, a lot of scholars who read that book speculate that what's happening is that he's brought to life with electricity because at the time when the book was written, people were doing all these different experiments to understand how electricity works. So we always think of Benjamin Franklin, you know, with his lightning and a key on a balloon, right? I'm probably messing that part up. But, you know, <laughs> so doing something with a circuit and electricity is actually a very appropriate tie to Frankenstein. Not that you only have to do Frankenstein-themed programs. But it but works. It does work. Okay. But it works. So you can bring your little paper Frankenstein to life using circuits. So I thought that was perfect. Um, in your robotics, your maker spaces, um, maybe you're already doing those kinds of programs. How can you relate it back? Um, maybe you've been thinking about how to start some of these things, um, but linking it with humanities gives you the perfect jumping off point to do that. So thank you so much. I am so excited about all of the ideas that you've helped generate, Christy. Um, one of the things that you've probably been thinking during this webinar is, all right, these ideas are really cool, but I have my own ideas for programs that combine STEM and the humanities. And that is why I'm really excited to tell you about some special grant making that we'll be doing. So you probably already know that Indiana Humanities offers regular humanities initiative grants of $2,000 to create your own public programs related to the humanities. But for Quantum Leap, we're going to have some special grant making of up to $4,000 for projects that combine the humanities and STEM. So this can be things on the history of science. This could be an exhibit about inventions or inventors or the history of science. Um, this could be a reading series. Let's say you want to do a science fiction reading series in your community. You could bring in talks. You could do tours. And then there's probably ideas that I can't think of, but that you can. So um, we hope that you will um, think about creating your own programs that connect to Quantum Leap in one way or another. You know, think back to those three animating ideas that I talked about at the beginning. Opportunities for people to explore the spirit and possibility that occurs when we bridge the humanities with STEM. Thinking about Hoosiers, how Hoosiers have, do, and could innovate in various STEM fields to make life better. And then also creating space for us to wrestle with um, things that are exciting as well as things that are a little bit scary about STEM innovation. There will be um, one thing to note here is that um, our grants do require the involvement of a scholar in planning or implementation. Um, so this may be something where you want to develop an exhibit. You just would want to work with a humanities scholar to help you develop um, what that exhibit's going to be about. Or maybe it's um, involving a humanities scholar. You want to do a reading series, and you want to invite someone to come facilitate those discussions or help you pick the books for them um, and develop discussion questions. There are a lot of different ways to involve humanities scholars, and I encourage you to visit our website, and I can connect you with our director of grants. He's always good and willing to talk through um, questions around, you know, is this idea going to fit your grant guidelines, stuff like that. Um, there are three deadlines in 2017 and 2018, so we know we'll be doing at least three rounds of these grants. Um, the first deadline is at the end of the summer, July 31st, um, for projects starting after October 1st. Um, and the full call for applications is on the Indiana Humanities website. And I apologize. I know I talk really fast. It's because I'm so <laughs> excited. Um, so again, we will have grants of up to $4,000 for projects that combine the humanities with STEM. We do have a full call for applications on our website. 
And uh, the first deadline for those grants is on July 31st. Harry Potter's birthday. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I had no idea. I didn't have that tattooed on my upper arm. I didn't know. I know it because it's my birthday. <laughs> Okay, so just a reminder, as Leah was talking about, there's so many possibilities when it comes to STEM and programming, and Leah, it's all over the place for library programming, it's, and even school programming. I mean, it's definitely STEM, STEM, STEM. So a lot of us have already been thinking about ways or maybe even implemented those things into programming in public libraries. But if, when you're seeking grants for the humanities, I just wanted to point out, just a reminder, that it's a, it's a don't forget that plus sign. It's a mixture of the two. In humanity, sometimes when people ask, I'm sure, it's kind of a very you know general thing, but you want to be remember it's literature, history, art, music, philosophy, our shared cultural heritage, and then add in the STEM. And there's so many different ways um, to do it. So just keep that in mind when you're applying for funding. Yeah, one way to think about this is if you are reading a novel that has to do with STEM, you are doing humanities. Um, you might be looking at um, anything that has to do with the ethics or morality of um, science, technology, and innovation. That's humanities because ethics and that's part of philosophy. Um, but if you're looking at the history of Hoosier invention, or not just Hoosier invention, but of invention more generally, that's going to be humanities. Art and music sometimes get into gray areas, but we can talk you through what those distinctions are and help you put together a successful proposal. Now I want to just conclude with um, some sneak peeks of a few more Quantum Leap things that we're going to be rolling out over the next um, two years. So one thing that I'm really excited about is we're going to be putting together a discussion toolkit for a speech that Martin Luther King gave when he accepted the 1964 Nobel Prize. Um, and this is a speech a lot of us are really familiar with, I have a dream, or I've been to the mountaintop, some of these kind of speeches. This is a speech that I had actually never read before. It's called The Quest for Peace and Justice. And it's an incredible intersection of STEM and humanities. Because in that speech, Martin Luther King starts out by talking about all of the advancements our society has made. So he says, you know, we can send a man to the moon, we can call someone on the other side of the earth, you know, we can travel super fast, we've closed the distance between people. And yet, is our society really living up? Is our, have we made moral and social progress on par with our technological progress? And I think this is a question that is as relevant in 2017 as it ever was in 1964. I was just going to say, how timely. How timely. It's like he was really, really wise, you know? <laughs> um, so what we'll be doing is putting together a discussion toolkit that you can use to host um, a 90-minute discussion, you know, for eight or more people um, in 2018. So we'll probably roll these out next fall for programs going on in 2018. You'll be able to do them anytime in 2018, but it's an especially good fit if you're looking for a Martin Luther King or Black History Month program, or actually April 4th is the anniversary. Next year will be the 50th anniversary of his assassination. So April is another good time to possibly be thinking about this. Um, and we'll provide you with an honorarium, probably $100 or $150. We are still budgeting that out. Um, so that's just something to be on the lookout for. Um, I'm really, again, interested in these questions about um, how we compare our technological progress with our kind of our social or moral growth. I think that's a rich area for discussion. And then I just want to highlight a few other Quantum Leap programs. These are probably more for you to take part in, although we're always open to pitches for how you might partner with us on something. So we have a series, the first logo that's up there with the yellow and green speech bubbles, um, called In Conversation. This is where we invite um, a, an interesting, thoughtful, thought leader kind of person and have a conversation with them on a stage. And we're doing several events with people that are authors. So these are, so far, the ones that we have scheduled for this year are taking place in Indianapolis. But we're doing one um, with um, Alan Lightman, who's the author of Einstein's Dreams, later this month in April. You can find more information about all of this on our website. We're doing an amazing one with um, Tracy Fullerton, who's a game designer. We're doing this as part of Gen Con, but you don't have to go to Gen Con in order to come to this talk. Um, she has designed an online digital game based on the book Walden, and it's a really, really wild and strange example of digital humanities, and we're excited to welcome her to Indianapolis. She lives in California. 
Um, and then next fall, we're going to be doing a program with um, the Center for Ray Bradbury Studies, which is based at IUPUI, another great quantum leapy STEMI place. And for adults over 21, we are working with a local cider maker to create a dandelion wine inspired cider in honor of Ray Bradbury. So you might want to join us for any of those or other programs coming up in our In Conversation series. The next one over here, you'll see the little magnifying glass in the map. We're doing a series of adult field trips um, where we're going to be going to sites of Hoosier in, in, um, in invention or inquiry. So laboratories and observatories and other places where science happens. And while we're there, we're going to take a tour and learn about the science and then also do some short readings that help us think about what's the impact of that science. So a few of those are already scheduled. We're going to be doing one in Mooresville at the Link Observatory in July um, and thinking about space, which is a question humans have thought about for, and written about for thousands of years. We're going to be doing one at the Indianapolis Zoo in August and looking about what makes humans different than animals if we're so different after all. Um, and we'll get to go behind the scenes with those orangutans. That one's going to be wild. That sounds fun. Um, and then we're going to be doing one next um, fall in the Indiana Dunes, which are actually a very important um, laboratory for understanding the field of ecology. So those are a few examples and a few more in the works I can't tell you about. So maybe we'll see you on one of those field trips. And those all have beer involved, by the way, because they're for <laughs> grown-ups. Um, Christy's like, I never get to do beer with my teen program, so no, we no. get to do a lot in the Humanities. <laughs> a few other things. You'll see this little blue microphone down here. We are doing a series of podcasts, and some radio stations are also broadcasting these. These are short five-minute stories of Hoosier invention and ingenuity. So it's a great compliment to the poster. This might be something that you want to listen to or highlight in some way. Um, uh, it's a great way to learn some little-known discoveries. Um, we're trying to tell stories that maybe people aren't as familiar with in Indiana history. Um, and then coming up in May, we are doing a statewide, for the first time ever, a statewide version of a program we do called Chew on This. So Chew on This is like a simultaneous dinner party that happens at multiple restaurants at once. And everybody comes, you kind of pay ahead of time. So you get to the restaurant and you're at a group with, you know, 10 to 15 other curious Hoosiers. And there's a facilitator there who's an expert in whatever the topic is. And you have a discussion and share a meal with people. And the topic that we're um, tackling for our very first one is the question, are you sure? So how <laughs> do we know what we know? So questions of evidence and facts and reality and truth and evidence, or I said evidence already, uh, validity, reliability. Um, these are questions that we ask in the sciences and in the humanities. And frankly, these are questions we are all asking every day. How do we know what we know? How do we know what's true or not? Um, so we think that'll be a really fun program, and we're going to have sites all over the state, including Valparaiso, Fort Wayne, Jasper, Bloomington, Greencastle, Indianapolis, Carmel, Muncie. Can't remember if there's any other places, but that's where we're starting. Um, it covers it pretty well. Yeah, I hope so. I know that we're still some corners we're not going to be in, but we hope maybe there's one near you that you'll want to come to. So. We have done a lot of talking about what's going on um, with our programs and what we're excited about with Quantum Leap. So I'm going to turn it over and let Suzanne let us know if there's any questions that you guys have or you want to share with the group. Feel free to go ahead and type in the chat box if you guys have some things to share. I'm going to share a few notes that I was taking during the presentation. Um, I wanted to just mention to take advantage of any local places that you have near you, um, like for example, Mooresville doing something with the Link Observatory, I think that's awesome. I was also thinking like, wouldn't it be interesting to do a tour of a factory? Maybe you have a factory in your community and you could reach out to them and see if you could bring a group. Um, even taking like children to the optometrist so they can see all the little doohickeys <laughs> that they use when they're looking at eyeballs. Um, maybe you've got a printing press, maybe you have some sort of a lab. I mean, we have a lab here in the State Library having to do with, you know, paper and curating and things like that. Um, so that might be interesting to, to take kids to that. Even the high school chemistry labs would be really interesting to bring children to. So those are those are some other ideas. Looks like uh, Kim says they took their their people to the local weather station. That would be really neat. I would love I would love that trip to see behind that. Um, Anita is asking, 
Okay, when you do tours, do you actually transport people or do they have to find their own way to the location? So for the tours that we are offering, you'll have to find your own transportation. Um, we, we actually were inspired by a program we started last year for the Bicentennial called Next Indiana Campfires, where we took people on hikes and bike rides and canoeing trips through wild places and read um, great works of Hoosier environmental writing. So we thought, well, we should try to keep this going. We're actually going to do more Next Indiana Campfires trips um, all over the state. You can find more about that on our website. Um, but we do need people to get there because it's hard when you're doing it when you're serving all Hoosiers Where would you start the bus? You know yeah. like <laughs> to get you all out to wherever we're going Yeah. And Leah are you guys okay with us sharing the slides with our participants? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. So Kelly uh, Kathy I think yes, we will send those out to all of you guys Did anyone have other ideas that they wanted to share? Um, I also wanted to mention about the connection with steampunk as a style. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't really talked about that. Um, I think that that could be uh, some other tie-ins that you could you could take a look at, especially when you're thinking of designing, you know, a, a display or something like that. Steampunk might be a nice um, tie-in for this. Oh, and I also wanted, um, while we're sort of waiting for some folks to type, did you mention at your Frankenfest, did you mention the fact that you will be reading the entire book? Well, is we that didn't a say secret? It was a readathon. Okay. We want to. That's a great point to clarify. So yes, we will actually be doing a call probably later in the summer for readers who want to volunteer to read maybe a couple of pages out of the book. So we'll have a readathon. I'm. I was inspired. There's a museum in New England called the New Bedford Whaling Museum, and they do a 24-hour readathon of Moby Dick every year, which I think is awesome. Um, Frankenstein's about half the length <laughs> of Moby Dick, so it won't be 24 hours. We estimate it'll probably be um, start to finish, probably eight to ten hours of, of straight reading. But there will be other things going on at the same time. Christy, did you want to add something? I was just going to say, I think uh, Suzanne had found, I think some public libraries or communities had even used Frankenstein as their kind of one, you know, their county book or mm -hmm. one read book. So just wanted to point out that that's great. Now we get to share it with the whole state. And if if we have anybody here today or if you want to contact them and, you know, see what worked for them, I think they looked like really robust, successful programs. Mm -hmm. So um, just kind of wanted to give them a little, <laughs> a little bit for doing that and, you know, they may not want to redo that book, but there's so many other things I think that we've put out there today that they could still get involved and still be able to, to participate in this program. That's great. And there's lots of ideas that are flying fast. James says that if anyone's close um, to Purdue in West Lafayette, there's an uh, aeronautical and engineering building that you can visit. So that's exciting. Also, veterinarian schools. You know, I mean, there's so many different tie-ins that you could do. Um, if you have a medical school close to you yeah. and you can do a visit there, that would be really interesting. We're we're working on a field trip with Purdue, possibly more than one. Um, I'm also very interested in a lot of the ag tech, so the development of new kinds of plants and seeds, as well as all the, I mean, now they use drones to do farming. You know, so I think that there's a lot, especially for folks in rural communities, you might also reach out to your Purdue Extension office. Um, I know when I was in fifth grade, that's who came and taught me how to build a circuit. So, yeah. That's great. Okay, we are getting close on time, so I'm going to have Leah and Christy go ahead and wrap up. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, so, we'll just wrap up by saying um, this is hopefully the start of a conversation and that you have lots of ideas. So, uh, we'll follow up with you. My information's on the, the slide here. You can go to, um, I realize now, very foolishly, I don't actually have the Indiana Humanities website up here, but it's indianahumanities.org. If you go to that website, oh, it is up there. It's just not hyperlinked. All right, so if you go there, you will you can find um, general information about our grants and programs. You can find lots of information about Quantum Leap stuff. If you heard about something and you're not sure where it is on the website, just give me a call or an email. My, um, you can find my information, my email, and all that stuff is on our website as well as on the screen here. I'm the Director of Programs and Community Engagement. And once again, I'm here at uh, the State Library and the Young Reader Center, but also co-director with Suzanne, uh, the Indiana Center for the Book. 
And we do plan next fall when those Frankenstein applications open, we'll probably do another webinar that's much more focused on the nitty gritty of, you know, how the application process works um, and all that stuff. So be thinking about what your 2018 program will be looking like um, because that's really our goal is to do as much of this as possible. Then um, if you want to make a special case for why you should start sooner, you just need to give me an email. I'm not saying I can do it, but I can try. Okay, so thank you guys so very much for participating. Um, I did see Deborah's question. We will go ahead and capture the chat so that we can send that out to everyone who participated today. So thank you, Leah. Thank you, Christy. Um, I really appreciate having Indiana Humanities here. Bronwyn Fetters, who does our uh, novel conversations, has actually been monitoring our chat today. So thanks, Bronwyn. Okay, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and have Christy click on the lobby button for me. Yep, and then we'll go ahead and do this. Thanks everybody so much. I'm gonna put up your LEU here in just one second.